Jai Hind, Jai Bhar. Welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achins. I have with me Lieutenant General Narsimhan, who's going to tell us, in no simple words, the state of Xi. When I say Xi, it's not the energy Xi, it's Xi Jinping. What's actually happening with the man who leads China, our biggest adversary, and what is he going to do in the future? Sir, thank you so much and welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adi, to have you uh, to, to have me on your show, and it's always a pleasure to be uh, with you. Thank you, sir. So, you know, the I, I was actually looking for this topic, and I said the state of Xi Wai, because pretty much everything is revolving around him today in China. So, how do you see him itself as the chairman of all things in China? Uh, you see. Uh, you need to go back a little bit again. As I keep telling every time I come on the show that go back, come to the present and look at the future. See, the moment he came into power in 2013, he got all the three chairmanships. There is chairman of the Central Military Commission, general secretary of the party and of course president of the country. Uh, as for that, then, you know, then he got to know something known as Xi Jinping thought, which, which came out. Okay. Uh, in China, actually, every leader, every leadership, the generation of leadership, that is, you know, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and then Xi Jinping, all of them leave a legacy behind. Okay, And that legacy is something that is attributed to them and that is incorporated in the constitution of China. Like, for example, for Mao Zedong, it was Mao Zedong thoughts. Deng Xiaoping, it is Deng Xiaoping theory. Jiang Zemin, it is Jiang Zemin's three represents. Hu Jintao harmonious society and mm. Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping thought. Okay, that is how they become immortal. So he gave the Xi Jinping thought, and if you go through the Xi Jinping thought of 14 tenets of that, you will find that basically he is trying to give shape to what is already there in the in the in the, in the system. That is the first point. The second point, there is something which no which came up as the chairman's responsibility. System, chairman responsibility system, chairman of the Central Military Commission, the responsibility system that the responsibility for the entire thing leave, lies with the chairman. Third, he also nominated himself as the commander in chief of the PLA. That is, these are the three things that came up as soon as he came to power. And ever since that time, two, three things have happened. One, Mr. Xi Jinping has been trying to take the social contract back to the Maoist peace. That is point number one, in the sense that if you look at it, then the moment he became the chairman, he had, took the people to Putian, Putian conference, where Mao also had the conference earlier. So you find that he trying to take you back in time to the system. And the reason for that was the social contract that was existing at the initial state of when China became PRC, that is the party people social contract. Simple, simply put, it says, Party says, I will give you development, I will look after your welfare. In return, you need to give me implicit obedience and implicit support. So that is the social contract that was existing. When Tan Xiaoping came and he opened up the entire system, then that social contract actually took a back seat. And probably some people were allowed to become rich. So from a people-centric kind of a policy, it went away from the people for a while. In the sense that Tan Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Ho Jintao, all of them followed. When Xi Jinping came to power, what he did was he tried to take the social contract back to the people. So that is the change that you see actually happening in terms of, in terms of, uh, you know, the common prosperity that he talked about, the dual circulation strategy that he talked about. All of them are actually trying to put money in the hands of the people, more money in the hands of the people. So that, that social contract, which was changing over a period of time, goes back to the original one. So this is the thing that basically is the structure that you need to understand. All other things flow out of this. And second thing he talked about was the Chinese dream. Chinese dream or China dream as you may call it. And also of the national rejuvenation. Okay, these are the two things that came up around that time. If you go through the Chinese dream, Chinese dream again is not a new one. It's a very old one. I have spoken about it earlier also. And it's a very old concept. She revived and say that Chinese dream, if you look at the four tenets of the Chinese dream, Three of them talk about internal issues, how to develop the country, how to develop the people's living standards, etc., etc. One of them say 
that you know we need to improve the influence of the country in the in the international system but national rejuvenation if you look at it it talks about the uh, the uh, reunification of motherland and other things which have got an external connotation so chinese dream is more of internal orientation whereas the national re re national rejuvenation is having an external orientation so when he came again the the, the two centenary goals came up the 2021 and 2049 2021 is the centenary goal of 100th year of the communist party coming into power and uh, so communist party communist party being raised and 2049 is the period where the 100th year of china becoming a people's republic is achieved so these two centenary goals also were in the, in the focus at that point in time so by 2021 they wanted to <clears throat> achieve a status where they have a society they have a country which has been developed in an all round way in a moderate manner in the sense that if you convert that into 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 physical terms it, it means that it is a medium level european power is what they would like to come by 2021 and by 2049 they would like to be a leading power in the world it's as simple as that and once that that is achieved the same thing also transcended i mean percolated down to others like for example if you take the pla another hat which xi jinping wears he talks about 2021 being uh, the pla being modernized in terms of mechanization and informatization informationization and by 2049 he wants to create a pla when i say pla it's all inclusive army navy air force rocket force strategic support force and the like he wants to create a pla which is capable of which is a fully modernized pla capable of winning wars all across the globe by 2049 so when you set a centenary goal of 2049 it has got its own its own divisions which go into the other hats that he wear that is wearing so you find in all three avatars he has got two goals coming up one to go back to the people centric approach two to become a world power by 2049 if you have these aspects in mind i think whatever actions he does can fit into it in 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 some form or the other so that is the answer that i have for your question that's an interesting paradigm for a country to be in sir because he's 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 basically looking for everything to go right i agree that is that is what he is trying to look at but he also says he look at the speeches he has made over a period of time and recently the speech he made he talks about uh being prepared to face headwinds mm -hmm. strong headwinds struggles and headwinds and yeah mm. so he is also aware that this is not going to be so simple he has to face certain amount of uh, headwinds he has to face certain amount of opposition etc etc one interesting thing which came up in the in this month uh, august there is a meeting of peitai here the peitai here meeting happens every year and this year also it happened and that peitai ha meeting basically is for all the elders who have gone past the uh, prime to come back to discuss important things with the present uh, present leadership okay but this time around there's a very important uh, very uh, interesting change there was no leadership the estwe leadership was not there basically because chiang semen had passed away thanks you having his passed away in any case earlier and mr hu jintao was actually is a little old and not keeping very well so you find that there were no leaders to come and ask the questions to sitchen pe so if that is the case then what happens here one of the th and anything happens in peita head doesn't come out immediately after that you have to wait for a period of time slowly and steadily you know something will trickle down and you need to put the pieces together that is how you need to work around peita head one of the thing that came out was that 45 or 50 of the um, leading technologists technology people who are dealing with research and you know cutting edge technologies were the ones who went for baitai which tells me that there is going to be lot more of a um, lot more of importance and lot more of resources put into the research and development of cutting edge technologies and this is also supported by mr xi jinping over a period of time talking about innovation like hmm. 2014 he made the statement on innovation then 17 20 21 now so he has been continuously talking about innovation being the backbone for development of the country yeah. Yeah. and these scientists and all are going to help him do that so obviously innovation r and d technology is going to get some kind of boost from now onwards 
Of course, economy has been in a bit of a trouble, as you, as I'm sure everybody has been leading. I'm sure it is. But my own understanding is that, you know, I think we jump to conclusions a little too quickly. You know, one month, the results come up and then you start judging. Okay, nothing has happened here, nothing has happened Collapsing. there. Collapsing, you know, <laughs> deceleration, you know, whatever, you know, you keep talking about. My own understanding is that, you know, for a larger country like China, even if you implement policies, even if you give policies, for them to get implemented and then get some results, it's going to take time. It is not, you know, it doesn't happen there. So you need to probably wait and watch over a period of two or three quarters to see how it goes. And in any case, what people actually miss is, over a period of three decades, they grew at 10% and beyond, right? And everybody in the world, including the Chinese, knew that that is not going to continue. It's not possible to continue that rate of growth. So over a period of time, in any case, their growth rate was to come down to 4 to 5 percent. And then go down maybe to 3 to 4 percent over a period of time. Because all well-grown economies, well-developed economies like US, etc., etc., none of them grow beyond 3 to 4 percent. You look at those growth percentages. So, to, to demonize a country because it has gone down in certain amount of growth, in a short period of time, I would be a little cautious about it. I will wait for more results to come in. I will wait for, I will look for more fundamental, uh, fundamental parameters that you need to look at and then come back. You do the, you do the, you read the analysts now on economy of China. You get two sides of the coin. One side says they are decelerating, they have gone and uh, they are actually uh, peaked and everything else. The other side says, you wait, wait, wait. These factors are still growing. These factors are still growing. So you wait and watch. So my own reading is, you take both the sides, but wait and watch as to how the parameters grow over a period of time or decelerate over a period of time and then make up a conclusion. So to my view of thinking, I think you need to wait for another quarter or two before we make up our minds on this. Because we, 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 we tend to kind of uh, project everything that happens to China with regards to its economy. And that's what we do with ourselves as well. So that's something Correct. which is understandable. So let's as talk about... India, India, sorry. Please, 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 please. As, sir. Far, as, as far as India-China trade is concerned, it is still at the same level this year also. It does not. Absolutely. It does yeah. not no, I, uh, so, you know, in all honesty, it's about 0.03% lower as a matter of fact, as per the official figures. I mean, it's practically <laughs> nothing. It's practically yeah. nothing. You will find you yeah, have, yeah. your trade deficit will continue to remain anything between 95 to 100 billion dollars as it yeah. used to be. And I think it has not changed in, changed a bit. No, indeed, indeed. I was just, I was just uh, on a lighter note. So, when we look at BRICS, uh, Xi Jinping has this aura that he wanted to kind of maintain with regards to his presence there. So he got himself a state visit. He got himself, you know, an award, uh, all that stuff. But skipping that business forum. Uh, after that, the faux pas with regards to his own personal presence there with the with the with the translator faux pas. But at the end of it, for so for a for a country like at that stature, if it's that's what they try and project. Fopas are not taken very lightly. Uh, I, apart from I that, agree. His own pers persona, sir, was not very. Um, Xi Jinping has that thing, you know. He'll be his his face is not very expressive, but then his body language has been positive. He stands straight. He's a big, tall, strapping guy. He's not a you know uh, five foot Chinese. He's a big, he's a big tall. I agree. Uh, I mean, he's, he's pretty strong and fat and, you know, heavy, heavy sort of a person. His body language was not very, uh, you know, this thing. And how do you see this entire thing that, uh, you know, he also uh, actually just, if I may add before I finish the question is that Mr. Modi had said he might just visit, you know, he might not visit and uh, do virtually. The next day, the, two days later, the Chinese foreign ministry said, oh, Xi Jinping is also thinking of doing it virtually. Two days later, Modi sahab said, I'm going. And then he also said, I'm going. So what is this happening here? He's, he's I mean, why is he in such a power play sort of a game? Hey, it's not a question of power play. If you look at BRICS, okay. BRICS came up in 2001 by the yeah. uh, what do you call it? That uh, agency which Sarah and Core, I think, put out that thing in yeah, 2001. 
if you look at the structure of that was initially brick then it became bricks including bricks. south africa if you look at that time russia was not economically very strong by around 2000 they were still weak in the sense of 89 when they 91 80 91 when they broke uss have broke up there after the economy went down and russia was in a state of you know still trying to grow the two countries which are at that point in time stronger in the brick group were were actually russia were actually china and india brazil was growing but it was it was not an economy which could actually compete with either china or india even now okay so in the brick group thing there are only two countries which were at that time strong enough that is china and india south africa came even today if you look at you know the second and fifth economies are part of brics russia is not in the first top six in any way and and others are all way way below and so you find brics generally is actually the domination i won't say domination the more important members as far as economy is concerned because brics came up on the economic platform correct and but i wrote a piece on uh, on this i remember in 2016 when mr C- mr xi jinping came came and visited here for mm-hmm. i think it was in kochi or something it was in kerala somewhere and that was that was the time kovalam i think it was somewhere it was there and then i wrote a piece on that basically the origin of brics is economic and if economy is the basis then the countries which have got more economy will have more importance in the group i think that goes without saying notwithstanding that the this time around again what what would have happened is china has got another 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 thing their leadership visit is never announced well in advance you will invariably see this that is generally announced just about a week prior that is how it happens so this wavering vacillating etc etc that the others keep doing it but they would have taken a decision whether to travel or otherwise much before because the leadership programs are not made on the last minute yeah but three years three hours three months four months before it is all made so he would have made up his mind unless something comes up very drastically to ensure that he doesn't go or to make sure that he doesn't go. but in the chinese system it is just revealed just about a week prior to all these visits taking place and they expect the host country also to announce it simultaneously with them that is the way the system works okay so you will find you know this wavering vacillating as a travel keep going but they would have taken a call in the internal system much before and they'll ensure that it is announced at the right time so if you look at it from that point of view this vacillation this thing that thing etc you take it in a stride ultimately when they announce it is the thing that you know is going to happen in fact if you take your mind back uh, i think xi jinping was xi jinping or li keqiang one of them was to visit nepal hmm. and the nepal 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 announced it much earlier than the chinese because the chinese called out the visit there after so that is the way that is the, that is the amount of seriousness with which they take all these things so this is something that i think many of us don't uh, understand this but that is the way the system functions and so to that extent i will not go much into the details of that but the very fact that he went is a thing that we need to be uh, knowing about the other things like his translator being stopped by the security in that hall etc i think it's all i think people have put it out take it as a pinch of salt this way or that way whichever way it is and i am sure later on you would have been allowed because otherwise you would have been able to communicate with the other so that is something that that you know we need to take so the, the skipping of the business forum yes is very important which you mentioned uh generally he would have uh, he would have actually been uh, like mr modi at the business conference yeah and with all guts and uh, all with guts and vigor and everything as mr modi does always it was a it was a hit a real hit when he spoke so that is the way it is expected to be i think in the in this particular point in time the chinese leadership would have been a little hesitant to face a lot of questions at this point in time. because you no know, the uh, there's a structural kind of uh, uh, issue which is panning out there you find the banks in trouble you find uh, real estate in trouble you find uh, many other issues in trouble and the expected the domestic consumption growth 
has not taken place. Mm. So they are into a lot of things and they need, and that is how he said that you need to be prepared to face headwinds and storms, etc, etc. When he spoke about last month, he gave the speech. <clears throat> so you have issues there and probably they won't, they won't have like, like Mr. Xi Jinping to be put up before that and then they send the car, the finance minister uh, in his place to do that. So this is something which could have probably been taken into consideration the present situation, economic situation that China is facing. So that way, if you see it, then maybe that there's a justification for skipping the business conference. And the business confidence in China from the outside companies which are going in is also coming into question. Uh, with all the things happening inside, you find the, the new business investment that are coming in, the FDI. FDI generally used to grow in China 15 to 16 percent. So that is a general thing. You know, even when decoupling and all people were talking about, the FDI was increasing, which, which gave a clear indication that people are not wanting to decouple. But this time around, the FDI seems to be reducing. So there is a lack of interest or a lack, there is a concern coming up on the investor's mind, whether all things will be good if we invest in China. So all these things are happening simultaneously. Internally, also you would have noticed, on his way back from BRICS, he stopped at Xinjiang in, in, in Urumqi. And then he made a statement about the social cohesion and things like that, etc., etc., which Again. indicated yeah, which indicated that probably the policies that they were following in Xinjiang would continue. Okay. So basic if you look at all this and then put it into one basket and see as to what how things are going, there are problems which China is facing. It is not that other countries are not facing problems. All other countries are also facing problems, okay. Any big country will face problems. So the only thing is probably the kind of measures that China is trying to take to overcome those issues is still to bear fruit or otherwise. We will come to know over a period of time. We will have to wait and see. So all these things put together, I think it do not have really gelled well for him to go into the business conference, etc. Et so that is one, one aspect. Of it. If you look at the other aspect, that China was the one who was wanting to increase the membership of BRICS. Okay, even before they went into BRICS, they mentioned this, that you know you would like more number of people to come and more from the global south is what they were saying. So that is basically to champion, to project China as the champion of the cause for the global south. Okay, so to that extent, they got six countries coming and joining from uh, 1st of January 2024. And with five of them, we are, we, India has got a strategic partnership already. And I think Ethiopia is the only country with which you don't have a strategic partnership and ensure something, something will come up in future. So, uh, to that extent, India got what it wanted, China got what it wanted. So, to that extent, I think this, uh, this expansion of this BRICS with the six countries coming up is something that, that has happened and which is actually a good thing to do. And, People are talking about there are other countries which want to join. There are almost 20 countries standing in line to join the BRICS. And if that comes up, it will act as uh, another group which could, which could be a counter to, or I wouldn't say a counter, which could be a champion for the causes of the global south, if you put it that way. Then I think that could be a better way of looking at it. So BRICS, particularly with the economic aspects coming up and this coming up, and also, I think um, uh, Prime Minister proposed a space forum in the index. So that is another thing. If it, that comes up, that cooperation comes up. Brazil has been actually using China to launch its satellites. They use something on a CBER, China, Brazil, yes, this was a satellite. They have been launching over a period of time. And they had the space cooperation earlier. And we have our space, of course, our space, uh, uh, space operations have been really good. Sandra and the latest in that. So you find that is coming up. So BRICS as a cohesive group is likely to come up and I think they should continue to concentrate on the on the economic aspects for which the BRICS came into existence and the BRICS bank got created as, as an alternative to the World Bank and IMF. So BRICS overall, if you look at it, Chinese, even though you know a lot of people looked at you know how Xi Jinping walked, whether this translator came along or otherwise or whatever, but I think Overall, I think even China got what it wanted in terms of increase in membership. 
and uh, India also got what it wanted because they wanted all most of the strategic partnership that we have those countries to come in that got done. So I think it's a win-win. Uh, I won't say use the term win-win because win-win is a Chinese term. Generally, they use it. So I won't say win-win, but I think both the sides benefited, and I think that is the way to see things. And this BRICS has been, I think, was a successful kind of a BRICS meeting that we have had. This is very funny, sir. The Chinese perspective of saying that we let's let's build this block so that we can create a West anti-West block and stuff like that by increasing the membership. Now it's damn difficult to get a consensus between two countries. Forget thirty. So I don't know where. Wh- what is the thought process behind their strategic line that they're trying to draw against the West? Because it is so meaningless when you look at it because you know none of the countries will stand up and say okay haan, chalo, let's make it there'll be only two russia and china the rest of the countries will not agree to it if you look at um, there has been a bit of unhappiness about the way the uh, the Bretton Woods system yeah of course you know, i am a world bank etc i've been <laughs> dealing with global south and there has been also, a sense of dissatisfaction in the way the UN has been functioning, overlooking the interests of the global south. So, those things are already there. That is one thing that we need to keep in mind. The second thing that you need to keep in mind is the BRICS Bank, when it got established, it was one of the one of the financial institutions that was supposed to be functioning on the principles of transparency, on the world level kind of standards that that the financial institutions have established, but more more catering towards the requirements of the South, global South. And uh, it has done well. It has not done badly for, uh, for, for, for the time for which it has been in existence. And over a period of time, people are fe- feeling that it could actually give a run for World Bank for its money. So, that is something that we need to keep in mind. And one of the reasons why India has joined, why would India join an anti-West kind of a thing, you know, we don't get into these talks, etc., etc., is that because even India felt that, you know, there needs to be a change in that system. So we need to be part of something which is, which is you know, which needs that change. So I think if you look at it from that angle, it, it makes good amount of sense that we join both AIB and NDB as initial members, which many countries were you know, hesitating, we went and joined it. And even today, AIB is one of the most popular kind of uh, banks that have been established, basically because they follow the system of transparency, they follow international standards, and all the decisions are taken by the board in an unanimous manner. And we have benefited a lot by taking a lot of projects from them. So I think alternative system is something that I won't say an alternative system. We we support the rule based order, everything else, but I think we need to look at changes to the existing system. So that is something which which should cater for the global south and our interests. I think that's what we are looking at. Let's talk internally, sir. Uh, Xi Jinping does seem to have some pushback coming in. Of course, the mil- whole military fiasco that happened with the. Uh, Rocket force is a clear evidence that either they could not deliver what he wanted or there was some sort of a pushback towards him. And then after that, curiously, the state council came up and actually pushed back on his, uh, you know, foreign minister, anti corruption drive, common prosperity implementation, where the state council came and said, Kiar, if anybody is, you know, crossing a certain line, misbehaving with you, you let us know, we will take them to task and all that stuff. How do you see this? Because a lot of people will say, yeah, a statement and say, there's nothing. But in China, that one statement only means a lot. How do you see this as a pushback towards his, his plans and policies, sir? You see, uh, I think you missed the uh, foreign minister going away. That is another important oh, yeah, thing. Of course, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is a bigger one than rocket force because the, that is yeah. a huge, actually speaking. Just overnight, the foreign minister vanished and he's not still reappeared. In public, yeah. and, and these are also all Z men, so I call them the uh, XI he, he's, Z men. He's supposed to be one of the confidence of Mr. Xi yeah, yeah, Jinping, yeah. and his uh, his rise to the rank of foreign minister was, you know, very meteoric. The sense that 
it was a very quick kind of promotions he got <clears throat> and then overnight he seems to have fallen out of favor and he vanished the so, rocket force was a surprise again uh, if you look at <clears throat> the rocket force commander and the political commissar and one of the deputy uh, rocket force commanders also committed suicide though they said he died out of uh, ill health etc cetera, et cetera, but i think it came out subsequently that he died of uh, died of uh, suicide rocket force seems to have been in some trouble definitely but i am not sure it is because of professional issues because you know at the level of commander and deputy commander and political commissar is it's huge i mean it's like you know saying um strategic forces commander of india commander getting into trouble like that okay as an equal time saying as i put i put not that our commanders are going to get into some kind of trouble like that but <clears throat> it's huge i'm just about the level of it what is more interesting is the people who have replaced them okay people who have been removed have been removed they you can find reasons for it okay he was incompetent or he was corrupt he was had other misdealings whatever whatever but the people who replace them are even more interesting basically because the rocket force commander has come from the navy and the political commissar has come from the air force so that is very interesting because rocket force traditionally has been a ground forces command no. mm. okay but this time around a navy gentleman has come and replaced the guy and as a commander the air force guy has come as the political commissar so this is something which is again very uh, very uh, interesting yes. mm. we have to wait and see as to why these changes happen i am trying to reach out to certain people if i can find the reason for it in one of the next talks i can talk about it a little more Absolutely. but it is it is really surprising that you know the entire rocket force went into top but if you ask me whether it will affect the capability of the rocket force i would say no because all the bases the brigades etc they are all intact the commanders may have come and gone but i think the capability of the rocket force i don't think would have diminished in any form it would remain the same it's it's i mean how do you how do you look at xi jinping in this whole thing he has to you know i'll use a pakistani term for it disappear as foreign minister <laughs> <laughs> no uh the, the disappearance part of it is something which is common in china i mean you will find people at that level sir, of course you know when it's at that no, no, level you take your, no no you take your mind back you take your Pujintao. mind back so puchinta was of course that thing which came up in the, in the great hall of people was being moved etc that is okay that is understandable in some form or the other you please take your mind back to the vice chairman of the central military commission who rank actually very high as as high as the foreign minister who opposing and suit sai ho both of them were victimized immediately after their retirement serving chief of general staff cgs chang wan chuan all those people have been purged overnight so this has been happening over a period of time in china but again i would say that it has been happening in the recent past in the in the um, medium past it is not happening like who chinta us time and all don't happen it is unheard of yeah. actually speak mm -hmm. it is only in the last about 10 years you get to see all these things in china and in fact senior hierarchy particularly the pla hierarchy was never touched but this time around in the last 10 years you find number of very senior uh, on on forces officers have been actually purged so this is something with a change that has come in in, in mr xi jinping's time as part of his anti corruption drive uh, anti corruption drive is you can you can term it in a, any which way there are a lot of connotations so that we will talk about one is you know mr xi jinping is actually taking out his opponents people who are not loyal etc etc in addition to sorting out people who are corrupt etc whichever way you see it this level of purging is for the last 10 years only you get to see in china before that some political issues would have happened like lin piao he just vanished In, yeah. a, in an aircraft crash uh, those things happened in the 60s but that is in the very senior political level and political rivalry takes place that used to take place but this kind of purging is pretty new and uh, foreign minister etc going away is again pretty new this is something which we have to wait and see as to i mean i'm sure in china whatever happens 
it will come out after a year, two, three, whatever. Slowly and steadily, things will start coming out. Then only you'll be able to make out what happened really. Sir, his, <coughs> excuse me. The Chinese military talks about one war at a time. You know, the war yeah. zone campaigns. Uh, uh, what gives? Uh, he's got so many campaigns pretty much on right now. I mean, isn't some of his generals telling him, Sir, what are you doing? I mean, you're heating up everywhere. We can't do it. So, what is his off ramp, sir? Which ramp will he push back from? One, what's up with the army? And two, what's his off ramp? There are two things to this. One is he talked about the war zone campaign that was that came up in the early 90s, actually speaking. It talked about not fighting more than one strategic direction and not mobilizing the entire PLA. Okay. It, it yeah. was supposed to be fought with the forces that were in the theater, within the theater. And it was supposed to be finished within a short period of time. That is, they say that this war zone campaign should start and finish between the time the diplomatic talks fail and the other country actually starts attacking, maybe two, three, two to three weeks. That is the period in which this war zone campaign was to be completed. And accumulation of forces against the weak, the weak areas of the enemy, etc., etc. There's a number of things that they talked about in the WZC. One of the major things that they talked about in the war zone campaign is that the external power should not be allowed to interfere. Which means that you have a war with India, you don't want US coming in or anybody else coming in. Similarly, you have a war with, say, Taiwan. Taiwan, they consider to be their own, so there is a different issue. But some other place where you are fighting, you don't want an external player to come in and meddle with it. If that happens, then the war zone campaign will not be successful. Okay. There are many connotations to that. That is a different subject by itself. We can talk about it sometime later when it is required. The fact of the matter remains that today there is only one primary direction that China is looking at. And of course, on 8th of July, I think 2013, there is a, a paper called One Way Po which came out with six wars that China will fight in this century. Six wars of China, yes, sir. Six wars of China, right? And India's place came in number three or number four. I don't remember exactly. but Number three, number three. Third, third, number three. It came as number three, right? So the first one was, you know, Taiwan, etc., etc., were the ones which are actually... Taiwan, uh, Senkaku, yeah. India, uh, Inner right. Mongolia and Russia. So that is the way, that is the sequence in which they are supposed to work. But I am yet to see any country which can fight six wars in a century and then survive thereafter. It's not easy. Mm. And all these countries that you talk about, I mean, Taiwan is a different issue, but if you look at other countries, which, which are going to, which China is expected to fight in the century, it is going to be extremely difficult for them to do that. So, but, but in any case, I am very sure while they open up many fronts, like for example, South China Sea, you would have seen that in the Triton Island in, in, in South China Sea, they have been they have been building up a runway recently, yeah. about 10 days, 15 days ago, you found that. So while while they have opened up a number of places like Taiwan, South China Sea, India, uh, the One Belt One Road Initiative has not been going very well of late. Internal situation is extremely not uh, you know it's not very comfortable. So there are many fronts that have opened up. But to think that China will fight on many fronts simultaneously will be, I think, not a correct way of looking at it. If they understand that they also understand their limitations of you know, fighting. And Chinese actually do not enter into a fight unless they are sure of winning it. This has been one of the one of the tenets of you know Sun Tzu and others, you can see it. So you find that he will probably look at it, um, you know. They will not fight too many fronts at the same time. Internal, they have to do constantly. They have got no choice. Okay. That is where the party people cohesion is. So that is something which they will give priority beyond everything else. That is number one. Number two, they may look at, look at uh, South China Sea, which is easily doable at this point in time because the influence in South China Sea has increased tremendously over the years. So you find South China Sea may be a better option for them to go for as a number two option. Beyond that, they will have to take a call. Because if they want to fight, um, I'm just seeing a message which has come. Japanese fighter jets have been scrambled to, to meet the Chinese drones. 
Um, got the same update as well, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the uh, the uh, thing that they can do is South China Sea will so South China Sea will be doable. East China Sea will be doable to some extent, basically because till the time Ch- Japanese build up their strength, etc. Still, it may be doable in some form. But India of, uh, to take on India today is going to be difficult for China also. It is going to be uh, it is going to be cost, time, and effort uh, that is required to do this, and the kind of uh, uh, effect it will have on their economic growth. Because any war puts a country down by about at least a decade. Yeah. That is going to be difficult for them to uh, fathom. That is one, and it will also affect. Please understand this. It will also affect their goals of second centenary goal of 2049. Anything that happens in between this time, which doesn't go as per their calculations, which is going to put that target behind by decade or two. Whether they are willing to take that risk is something that we need to be looking at. So what I am trying to say is that the kind of fronts that we talk about, the Chinese have opened up too many fronts. Even though they have opened up too many fronts, I am sure they would have prioritized it in some form. And they will take on not all of them simultaneously. And internal is something which is far more important to them. Internal stability is something which is far more important to them. Because that is where the survival of the Communist Party of China depends on. So that is something which will be much more important to them. They will not fight too many fronts simultaneously is my own understanding. So what does he do with India, sir? With India, it, it's, um, you know... This is another thing that I keep thinking about over a period of time, you know, ever since uh, I've been watching China over a period of time. You know, are we more sensitive to anything that China does? Is one question I have been I have been trying to answer myself because anything China does, uh, there is a there is a kind of a reaction in India you can see. Yeah. And anything that India does. You get some reaction from China because I watch the Chinese language media, but it's not much so. So I'm I'm still thinking whether are we getting over sensitive to whatever China does? That is number one. That is not to say that we should not be sensitive. We should be sensitive, we should be careful, we should be preparing, and we should be absolutely be clear that you know we need to be handling China the way we want it to be handled. I mean, that is something which is which, which is unquestionable. But for everything that China does, should we be so sensitive? Is something that has been working in my mind. Maybe in some cases it is true. Like for example, when Galwan happened, it is really true that the way we reacted was the correct way to do it. Mm-hmm. Dolam happened, there is the correct way to do it. But then everything, other things that China does, like for example, he was naming a few places in Arunachal in Chinese, or Chinese language, in Mandarin. You saw the kind of reaction here. Yeah. How does that change anything? Like, for example, he went and gave 15 names in Mandarin in, in Indian Ocean. Does that mean that the entire Indian Ocean belongs to China? And that he did with the with the agreement of the monitoring bodies that deal with it. So I think we should not be overly sensitive. We should be careful. We should be building up our capabilities and capacities. There's no doubt about it, but I think we also should not be overly sensitive. But having said that, we should also understand that India is the only country that can actually pose as a competition to China in this region. In terms of economy, in terms of uh, technology, technology growth, in terms of space capabilities, in terms of any other issues. So you will find naturally he will be concerned about India. So he will take measures to keep us restrained, constrained, etc., etc. That is something that we should be aware of and that that is something we should be able to constantly be competing. That is something that we have to do. There is no other alternative. But I think, I think I've said this earlier also. 15 years ago, if you asked me whether if you resolve the boundary question, everything will be okay between India and China, I would have said yes. But today, I'm not so sure. Basically, because both countries are growing. We are competing for the same strategic space. And there will be some kind of contention every time that comes up. So I'm not so sure anymore. So if that is the case, I think we should be definitely be cautious about China. 
yeah the battle is kind of evolved and as per both the both the countries today i think one narrative is common and i think both of the countries agree that it's a class of clash of civilizations and this Class is a narrative is something which our foreign minister has refuted yeah and uh, the matter of fact, yeah he has refuted but you can you can kind of see that building up because it's not a border dispute it's like yeah. everything it's you know? not simply a border dispute yeah it's it's everything it's, it's modi it's and coming. modi versus ji it is jay shankar versus chingang at that time or wangi at this time it is it is a personal kind of a it's become personal now and that that is quite funny to me because normally it doesn't happen that way but i think in today's I polarized think world also because i think both the leaders are quite strong in their own country yeah 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 so both strong personalities strong leaders so that gets compared that gets pushed somewhere here there so those mm-hmm. things also play into that uh, equation that's true sir so lastly you know uh, the chinese would be looking at something very very closely right now would be the elections the taiwanese are going to elections the the americans are going to elections and of course india is going into elections uh they they are doing whatever they're trying to do with taiwan of course but how do you look at china uh, watching these elections because at the end of it they know two countries the election results will affect them will impact them one is taiwan and the second is americans so this is something that they know and they also know that the indian policy will be co- constant it's not because you know nothing is going to change here so that apart how do you see them observing the taiwan and the us thing going forward because you can see them kind of poking around within taiwan already you know it's ironical that women dang is the one which fought the communist party in 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 the earlier part and today china expects women dang to come back to power because dpp has been has not been very kind to ridiculous. the chinese uh, absolutely in, ridiculous in okay but to their surprise the kmt leadership one of them went to japan recently about i think a month ago and then he started uh, actually uh, criticizing china so now it leads leaves china with actually very little option okay if KMT also is on the same line as DPP. It doesn't matter who comes to power in Taiwan, right? But however, they would probably prefer KMT to come to power because KMT seems to have been closer to the Communist Party of China over a period of time. Okay, CPP Chen Shui-bian came to power. He had problems. Now Tsai Ing-wen has come to power. He has got problems. Mao Zedong was a little different, uh, different kind of a leadership. so you find that chinese would prefer the kuomintang to come to power and that is something which seems to be um coming into question a little bit basically because the vice president of taiwan has been to uh, paraguay and then to us and then he has come back and after he came back is uh, polling rates have you know the the uh, polling rates have gone up so they expect that you know he might come back to power <clears throat> so taiwan is taiwan elections are still a open book at this point in time who will come to power we don't know but if uh, kuomintang comes to power then the chinese will be a little more comfortable basically because then they'll be sure that the kind of uh, i would say uh, support to being independent being given by the present present uh, regime will not be there so to that extent they can breathe easy a little bit having said that if you look at the polls that it that are done every year in taiwan as to you know are you feeling a taiwanese are you feeling it to be a chinese do you want to be independent do you want to be dependent whatever you find the number of people who are feeling that they are taiwanese and not chinese has been increasing over the years so it's more gone more than 60% at this point in time so you find that this kind of people's view or people's ideas is something that chinese have to be cognizant about they have to take cognizance of so if you look at this whether it is kmt coming to power or whether dpp coming to power in taiwan it will be a bit of a touch and go for the chinese so they have to actually live by they got no choice as far as that is concerned as far as the us elections are concerned when mr biden came to power 
then the chinese felt that they will have a little easy time mm. okay because mr trump was going very hard against the chinese but then mr biden also proved to be the same because he has banned the company <laughs> he has banned the people he has banned a lot of things so in respect of who comes to power in us there seems to be a bipartisan kind of a consensus that china is going to be a competitor and that needs to be deal, dealt with it in that manner because in the in terms of cooperation competition and uh, the other one collaboration competition and conflict or something like that three of them they are talking about three c's that they talked about in that i think the collaboration part has been slowly given the go by more and more us is looking at china as a competitor at this point in time and that is going there is a bipartisan kind of a feeling that one gets to see in us so irrespective of who comes to power whether a democrat or a republican you will find the american policy towards china is unlikely to change at least in the near future so to that extent china is actually between the fire and the uh, fire, frying pan and the fire so whichever way it is they are going to be in, in a bit of a quandary there as far as india is concerned they do understand mr modi is a strong leadership mr modi's leadership is strong so they may like to have a weaker kind of a leadership uh, coming into place but we don't know whether the elections of india have got a mind of their own who will come to power only the electorate will decide and that we will have to wait and see but they would like a power which could be a little weaker is something which one can look at so if you look at these things you find us remaining unchanged of its attitude towards china taiwan is becoming more and more iffy whether it is kuomintang or the dpp coming into power either way it is going to be uncomfortable for china india whichever way it is it is going to be uncomfortable for china anyway so in all the three questions that you ask for i don't think china is going to find solace as far as the elections are concerned they are going to contend with all the kind of result that these elections are going to throw up so there is no easy way out for china in this particular thing i think you know you should you should address the anti biden camp within the america american establishment who who really believes that once uh, the kmt will come to power the chinese and the taiwanese will be hugging in the middle of the the, the straits and there will be peace for mankind after that so no no, no regime in taiwan also can survive that kind of a thing see yeah. maing chu had a had a thing going for him at that point in time he couldn't he couldn't pull it off right so then thereafter of course saing wen has got two tenures she has done basically china's actions in hong kong brought her back to power yeah she yeah. was not she was not the popular candidate at that point in time but the second term she got in because of china's actions in hong kong so you find that you know china's actions have got a repercussion and uh, nobody can actually say that you know i'll come i'll ensure that taiwan joins merges with the uh, mainland and then survive that is going to be difficult you know i was reading one one of these bloggers and he said uh, what the chinese should have done was to crack taiwan and hong kong at the same time that way at least you know they they wouldn't have had a, a learning experience of the taiwanese because people think taiwan china can just walk into taiwan yeah that's a different story in the forum mm-hmm. i know it's not simple it is not simple at all as many people think it's not just walk through there you can't do it there's a big taiwan strait in between and you know today with battle fit transparency what it is to assemble a force and then launch it and sustain it is going to be extremely difficult it's not going to be possible at all Yes, sir. and that even a non-military person like me can tell you because Absolutely. you can see the guy. And you MPPS, can see the guy. Amphibious <laughs> operations are one of the worst operations one can yes. ever plan and conduct. They are, yes. they are, they are actually you know troubled by the weather, sea conditions, whole lot of things. Yes. Extremely difficult operation to plan and conduct. Absolutely. So I must say this show has been like reading almost thirty, forty articles for me. uh 30 40 articles and opinion pieces because we've covered a nice little paradigm of things uh china is a mystery and i think uh, by you helping us you know guiding us into uh, a realistic sort of a picture rather than what we see as a hoopla on our media which is very very important uh, there are very few in india who give this very realistic balanced picture where you there is a plus here there's a minus there that we need to understand and cater for it to go forward So thank you so much for helping 
you know my myself and the audience out looking forward for many more interactions in the future sir till then thank you jai hind thank you very much thanks a lot thanks for having me on the show thank you sir